So whenever you're ready, Dr. Golic. Alright, so um, I thank you for having me. I kind of um, am excited about this thing since I got to ask. I'm like, yes, I get to work with the ninth graders again. Um, so I know a lot of your faces and I'm really excited about um, being here to kind of share with you um, how chemistry is involved with um, the history of the world. So I'm going to give you um, a little bit of an overview about what atoms look like. And some of this might be a review if you had other science classes. Um, and then we'll talk about a little bit about how the elements form, which is things that you should have read about. Um, we'll find elements on Earth and talk about the arrangement of the elements on what we know as a periodic table. And then we'll talk about making new elements and using the elements to make them. So that's kind of an overview of what we're going to talk about today. So, first of all, chemistry is, tends to be referred to as the central science. So if you look at this picture, you can see that chemistry is in the middle between geology, astronomy, plants, environment, physics, biochemistry, biology, and medicine. Okay? So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the most important science, although I like to think that it does. But it does mean that it has its hand in many different areas. So you guys are learning a lot about astronomy with the Big Bang Theory and physics. Mr. Quark came in last week and talked about how the, the physics behind all of it um, with the atoms and whatnot. So we're going to kind of delve into the chemistry of things a little bit more. Okay. So current models or representation of the atom are, mo are theories. Do you guys know what a theory is? It's part of the scientific method. Right? We always have to make an observation, then we have a hypothesis, and then we do some experiments. So a theory comes from all of those experiments. Um, so it's a, a well-confirmed type of explanation. So a lot of experiments are done, and it kind of works in many different ways. So the first person that started thinking about the atom was that of a man named Democritus. He was a Greek philosopher in 460 BC, and he lived until 370 BC, so 90 years in BC times. It's pretty long. It is pretty long. Um, and his idea was that if you cut something, anything that was out in the um, in the universe, right? If you cut it down, eventually it would be cut down to its smallest piece that could not be cut down any further. So an indivisible particle. And he called those indivisible particles atoms. Well, he didn't really use the scientific method because it hadn't really been discovered yet. So it was just really an idea at that point. And he got criticized for his idea. Well, about 2,000 years later, John Dalton comes along. And he kind of elucidates this idea of a solid sphere where or that would be called an atom. So he kind of took some of Democritus' ideas and said that it's an atom. He stated that atoms of one element are different than atoms of another. So he was the first one that kind of differentiated between different pieces. And that was all fine and dandy, and then J.J. Thompson came along, and I just really like his name, J.J. And he did an experiment called the cathode ray tube experiment, but he found electrons. Do you guys know what electrons are? Yeah, um, negatively charged particles. They're negatively charged particles, very good. So he didn't really know where the electrons were in the atom, he just knew that they were there, which was really cool and a really fun experiment. And then along came Ernest Rutherford, and he did an experiment called the gold foil experiment. And in the gold foil experiment, he shot these little alpha particles, these little radioactive particles, at a piece of gold foil, and thinking that they would just go straight through. But instead, some were deflected right back at him. So it was these particles, these alpha particles that are positively charged were hitting something positively charged, and they were repelling. And they o it only happened once in a while. And so what he found was that there was this dense nucleus 
that held all the positive charge of the atom. Okay. So he's the one that kind of came up with the idea of the nucleus in the center that held the, the protons, and then the electrons were all around outside. But they didn't know what the electrons looked like. So Niels Bohr and Erwin Schrodinger both tried to identify what the electrons looked like and what what areas the electrons were rotating in. And so Niels Bohr is common, um, is a way that you commonly see what an atom looks like. It's represented in that way where there's like rings around the nucleus, so kind of like the sun and the planets, okay? Um, but it didn't work for all elements. It only worked for hydrogen. You guys know why it might work for hydrogen but no other elements? What does hydrogen have? How many electrons? Just one, right. Okay, so it only has one electron. And so it works really well for that case, but it didn't work for any of the other larger elements. And so Erwin Schrodinger used some mathematical model. He solved a math equation that is really ugly, if you can imagine ugly math equations. And he currently has the most accepted, widely used uh, theory of what the atom looks like. But we'll still kind of revert back to looking at some of the, the Bohr diagrams because they're easier to represent and to see in three dimensions. So what does an atom look like? This diagram kind of shows the orbits or like the directions that the electrons are in outside of the nucleus. So the nucleus is where all the mass is located in an atom, about 99%, because electrons are really tiny in mass compared to that of the, um, the protons. So in the nucleus, we have red particles, or in this diagram, they're uh, red, okay? Those are protons. And the blue are things called neutrons. And neutrons don't have any charge, but they add to the um, mass of that nucleus. And then the electrons are on the outside. So a neutral atom has the same number of protons as electrons, because protons are positive and electrons are negative. So neutral atoms are new, um, have equal numbers. And does anybody remember from your reading what the size of an electron is compared to that of a proton? TJ? Is it maybe one eighty one in one thousand eight hundred? Yeah. So. Yeah. One is actually one in it's one eighteen twentieth the mass of a proton. Yeah. But it has like the same amount of charge as a proton though. Right. right it's it's just standard. opposite. Yeah. So it has the charge, right, a negative charge, a full negative charge, but it has much smaller, much, much smaller mass. It's kind of cool to think about, okay? Um, and so electrons are negative. So what are they going to do with one another? If they're negative and they come up against another electron that's negative, they're going to push away. They're going to repel, right? Just like two positives would repel, right? Opposites attract, that's the whole idea, and um, like things repel. All right, so that's what makes it really difficult to make elements, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit. But you can see uh, hydrogen versus helium. And we, you guys learned that hydrogen was present in vast quantities, and it started fusing, fu or con undergoing fusion to, be, uh, to produce helium atoms, right? So a hydrogen atom, what's the thing in the center? The nucleus, and what does the nucleus hold? The proton. The protons. Okay, so in that hydrogen atom on the left, the pink molecule, or the pink atom, there is one proton, and you can see the one red electron in there. Okay, that is the most common form of hydrogen, called hydrogen one. Okay. Hydrogen two is found in 0.02% abundance on Earth, and it has one extra neutron in there. Okay? So they're different isotopes. And I think you guys read about isotopes in your reading as well. So hydrogen 2 has one proton and one neutron, 
and one electron, whereas hydrogen one has one proton and one electron. So what's different between hydrogen one and hydrogen two? Hydrogen two is a, new, a neutron. A neutron. Okay. So isotopes have the same are the same element. They have the same number of protons, but they have a different number of neutrons in their nucleus. Okay. There's two different. Um, isotopes of helium that are commonly found on Earth. Helium-4, which is 99.9998% of all helium that is found on Earth, is helium-4, with two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. And then there's a helium-3 option that is 0.0002%, which only has one neutron in it. Okay, Does that make sense? So isotopes are the same element, they have the same number of protons. Protons tell us what element we have. Um, does that mean same amount of protons and electrons as always? Yes, in for a neutral atom. Yeah, very good. Okay. Can you guys hear the question? So that means that an a neutral atom has the same number of protons as it does electrons. So if it's the same atom, no matter what it is, right, any hydrogen atom will have the same number of electrons and it'll only have one proton, so it'll have one electron. Yes, TJ? Is the helium um, element the same thing we use to fill balloons to make them float? It is. Yep. That's the helium that we use. So out of a big balloon, you might have one tiny, tiny atom of helium-3. Everything else is going to be helium-4 all the other tiny, tiny particles. Okay. So I have a short little video that kind of explains the fusion process better than I can actually do it in, in person. So we're going to get that started. World. So fusion is when you combine two small, very small particles together, like hydrogen, right? Then it's the well final combination, which is a helium atom oh. with one neutron coming out, ends up being at a lower energy state. Hence, it sorry. is when you combine two small, very small particles together, like hydrogen, right? Then the final combination, which is a helium atom, with one neutron coming out, ends up being at a lower energy state. Hence, it releases energy in the reaction. It's energetically more stable. That wants to happen. So why is it hard to get there? Because of the Coulomb potential, right? As you get two positive charges close together, all they would want to do is repel. You need to get them close enough for the nuclei to touch each other and have this nuclear strong force take over. It's an attractive force that's stronger than the electric repulsion. And that will only happen by chance. It'll only happen when you get particles in a soup that's hot enough so that every once in a while, two protons are heading towards each other with enough energy such that before they get repulsed, the strong force takes over and grabs it and creates a new atom. If the energy is not high enough, then the probability is either zero or very low. And if the energy is too high, it's also very low. And there's a sweet spot, otherwise they won't fuse. Okay, how does the sun do it? Let's start with that question. Well, it's got a whole bunch of particles, you know, they're moving very fast and then... Okay, we're going to stop it there. Um, so, this video is kind of fun, um, and it talks all about how... Ah, how fusion takes place. Okay. So, um, they said that you have to have the right heat, right? The right amount of heat. So, outer space, is it warm or hot? Warm or cold? Cold. cold. It's really cold, okay? And so you have to have enough um, heat, right? Because that's the measure of, of particle motion. So they have to be moving. So we need to have some sort of heat and pressure. So the pressure is used to kind of keep the molecules close so that it makes that right soup, 
right? That makes it easy to, to do, okay? So the Big Bang um, helped pr make hydrogen turn into helium, right? And then stars uh, are, al are able to make things up to iron, which is element 26, okay? So it's, it's taking two other nuclei, maybe a helium and a helium, joining them together to make a uh, beryllium. Right? And we'll see that all the elements in just a few minutes. But it's how all these pieces kind of join together with the right speed and the right pressure to just overcome that coulombic force that would tear them apart to get them into that sweet spot where that, that nuclear force kind of um, joins in. Does that make sense? Okay. And then supernovas are super cool, and they're the ones that make elements of two. So, what about the elements that are on Earth? If we look at the element or the Earth's crust and core, we can see that oxygen makes up a, a enormous amount of our Earth's core and crust, followed by silicon. Does anybody know where silicon is on a periodic table? What it's right below? Is it below oxygen? Not below oxygen. Below nitrogen. Not nitrogen. You're close. You're getting closer. Helium. What's that? Is it under helium? Not under helium. It's under carbon. Okay. So we're carbon-based life forms. Right. A lot of our DNA and things in our cells and sugars that we eat are all carbon-based. And so silicon is right underneath carbon. It has a whole. It shares a lot of properties as carbon. Um, but you can see oxygen, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and then others are 0.8. And those are all the elements that are up here are elements that are below iron on our periodic table. So they were all formed in those um, from those stars. And that's the picture of the core um, and the crust. So that's where everything is located. So I wanted to tell you a couple of stories about finding certain elements because while these elements might be located on Earth easily, they're typically found in compounds or they're not able to be identified quite readily. So originally um, we had all these people that knew about different metals like copper and silver and gold and um, mercury, right? Mercury is the only liquid metal that there is. So they knew of all these metals, but they didn't really know anything else about any of the other elements. So um, they were all trying to make gold. Do you guys know what the name of the scientists that were trying to make gold are called? Alchemists. Alchemists. Okay, so they were all trying to make gold because gold was power, right? It was money. It was the crown the crowns that everybody wore. Um, for the royalty and whatnot. So gold equaled power. So they were all trying to make gold and they really liked the color. Do you have a question? No. Okay. So all these people were trying to do this. John Dalton said, there's no way because atoms of one element are the same as elements of that same element and different from other elements. So Henning Brandt um, was in Germany and he used a common golden liquid thinking that it might contain gold. Does anybody know what this common liquid that's kind of golden-like might be? Golden liquid. He used his urine. So he gathered up lots and lots and lots of his own urine and boiled it, fermented it, and then put sand in it. And what happened really amazed him. It began to glow in the flask. So it was kind of like it was a fire that was burning, which was crazy. And he called it icy noctiluca because it was cold to the touch. So if you touch the outside of the flask, it was actually really cool. So you could handle it with your bare hands. But he used his own urine in his basement because it looked golden-like. Like how much? Like over a year? Or like just... <laughs> That's he gathered a lot of it. Okay. That's disgusting. <laughs> but 
It's good to cool. It would smell pretty, pretty terrible. And he boiled it and then just put sand in it and it started to glow. He boiled it, added some other things so that it fermented a little bit um, and broke down. Because what is in your urine? Do you know? Uh, what like, he drank. Yeah. What he drank. So water. That's the main part of water. Okay. Um, and so one of the ways that you measure whether you're hydrated or not is how clear your urine is. Mm -hmm. So if you're well hydrated, your urine is clear. If you're not well hydrated, it's it can be a deep yellow color. So this was all these byproducts um, that were in his urine because of um, the phosphorus in our bodies, which t tends to stem from things like DNA, right? We have the phosphate backbone of our DNA, and so that's where the phosphorus in, our, in the urine would come from. It was just the deterioration and the the byproducts of that that were filtered out through our kidneys and whatnot. Kind of cool, right? But terrible. It smelled terrible on the magnet. Okay. So another element that was had to be found was that of oxygen. I don't recommend you ever trying to find phosphorus, by the way. Okay. Your parents might not appreciate that. Um, oxygen. So a man named Scheele in 1772 heated this this manganese oxide, so down here, and he noticed that a gas was forming. So he put it into the test tube, he actually inverted the test tube, and he saw a gas was forming. Um, How do you invert a test tube? Let's flip that upside down. So he had it um. plugged up. Okay. Um, so he attempted it with other compounds, other oxides, and found really similar results. And so they originally thought that this was phlogiston, right? So phlogiston allowed things to burn. You guys remember anything about phlogiston? It basically was air. And they didn't know what was, the air was a mixture of all these different gases. So they just called it phlogiston. He didn't publish his work, but he did share that information with Joseph Priestley in 17, or before 1774 who repeated all of Scheele's um, experiments. And he gathered up the oxygen, or gathered up the gas that was being formed from this experiment, and he put it under a glass jar with a mouse, thinking that the mouse was gonna be dead because it was gonna be, um, it was gonna have harmful effects. Well, it didn't have harmful effects. That mouse thrived and prospered because he was, drink he was breathing pure oxygen. And Joseph Priestley even attempted to breathe in the pure oxygen that was being produced and was very happy with the result, right? Um, so he claimed that it was five to six times better than normal air, which actually makes sense because of the amount of oxygen in air is, a, is probably about 15 to 20% of the air that we, we breathe. So five to six times better is about 100%. So that was a really interesting result that he was able to get precise measurements. And he published that work and claimed credit for finding oxygen, or for finding this gas. He called it deep phlogisticated air. And deep phlogisticated air meaning that it wasn't phlogiston, it was part of phlogiston. Well, that's all fine and dandy, and he gets credit for it because he was the first one to publish the work. So nobody really ever talks about Scheele because he didn't publish his work. So there's always this race to get your work published first because that's where you get, um, especially now you get more funding dollars if you can present something better. Um, so it, it, was, it was a race. Okay. And then along comes a man called Lavoisier in France, and he recognized that gas as being oxygen, not dephlogisticated air. So he was the one that called it oxygen and gets credit for, for naming it. Okay. So they started finding all these elements, and a man named Mendeleev came along, and he was able to kind of identify some similarities. So John Newlands was a scientist um, before Mendeleev, and he recognized that every eight elements kind of looked similar, okay? So carbon was similar to silicon, and they were eight elements apart. Uh, 
Fluorine was similar to chlorine, which was similar to bromine, and they were eight elements apart. Helium and neon and argon, eight elements apart. So he found similarities happening every other eight elements. And so he called it the law of octaves. So oct means eight, okay? And where do you hear about octaves? In music. And so he thought, he, he made this analogy to a piano, and in the room when he was presenting his, his idea, he got laughed at because they're like, go play a tune instead. We're gonna keep working on science. And it makes sense because what Mendeleev did was organize the periodic table and every eight elements found a similar element. So the law of octaves actually made sense. And he got laughed at. Um, so this is not exactly like the periodic table that we have today. Okay, first of all, his is kind of tilted 90 degrees from what we have, okay? And he has these little spaces in here, oop, yeah, that have question marks, right? And so he knew that there was an element there, but he didn't know what element it was. It hadn't been discovered yet. And so it happens in many different cases. Um, around 45, he estimated what that, that mass is going to be. Um, he estimated what the properties of that compound, or what that element were going to be. And when you look at the current periodic table, okay, you can see um, under boron and aluminum there's gallium. And gallium hadn't been found yet by um, Mendeleev, or by any scientist before Mendeleev. And Mendeleev estimated that it would have a, a mass of 68, and its mass is actually 69. So it was really close to what was expected. And the properties that he, he um, proposed were actually the same properties of that element. He did a really good job of, of kind of following some of the trends that were found on our periodic table. All right, so if you look at this periodic table, there's a couple of things that you'll notice. Hydrogen is up in the top left-hand corner all by itself. And helium is on the far right side by itself in that row, right? So hydrogen and helium, those two elements that were formed during the Big Bang, um, are in that top row. Then lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, okay, are in the second row. And neon is right underneath helium. So what do we know about helium? Do we know what it's called? Noble, noble gas. It's a noble gas, okay? So everything in group 18, in this last group, is called a noble gas. So they have very special properties. They are inert. So what does it mean to be inert? Yeah. Um, they have a hard time like, um, connecting with other right. atoms. Right. Absolutely. So they don't like to react with other elements or other atoms. Um, they tend to be gases that just kind of hang out by themselves, which is kind of sad and lonely, but they're very happy, right? And that's what allows helium to be the cool stuff that allows our balloons to float, right? Um, so you can find iron. Do you guys see where iron is? Mm -hmm. Number 26. Yes. Iron, so anything between lithium and iron are able to be formed in stars, right? They, they kind of build two helium atoms and they collide and they form something like beryllium, element four, and then you can have a beryllium and a hydrogen Bond, uh, connect and form boron, right? So in these stars, it's a really good place for all of these other connections to be made, producing more energy and increasing the elements that we see. Um, so if you look down toward the bottom, how many elements do we have naturally occurring on Earth? Do you know? 92. 92, up to uranium, okay? So uranium is, is element number 92, and any element before that is, is naturally occurring on Earth. Everything after that has to be made, okay? And so um, it's really cool to think about all the different ways that they're, they're made. So there is a, um, instrument, I guess you would call it, in Switzerland 
called the CERN Large Hadron Collider. And it's a particle accelerator. So basically what it does is it has all these magnets and it increases the speed of a particle. Okay, and so it's like this big circle of, of magnets and, uh, that's 27 kilometers long. So five kilometers is three miles. So multiply that by five, it's about 15 miles of a radius, or of, sorry, of a, of a circumference, okay? And they speed up particles. And they're at negative 271 degrees Celsius. So negative 271 degrees Celsius is 2 Kelvin. Do you guys know what absolute zero is? Isn't that where like, it gets so cold it can't go past that point? Right. So absolute zero means that all molecular motion has stopped. Okay, And that's where um, kind of the Big Bang actually began, was at zero, right? And then it particles started to move and, and produce energy. Okay, so... Um, this is really, really, really cold. Okay. Um, zero degrees Celsius is cold. What's two K? Two Kelvin. Like. It is equal to negative two seventy one degrees Celsius. Okay. Because absolute zero is is negative two hundred seventy three point one five degrees Celsius. Okay, so it was really close to absolute zero that's being, um, so this, these particles are kept really cold, right? But that's actually warm for, compared to the Big Bang, okay? What they're trying to do with this, this particle accelerator is simulate Big Bang conditions, okay? And they're really close to doing so. And so they have these particles and they can take these particles and accelerate them around and then when they want them to, they collide, okay? So you've got like particles going in opposite directions around this thing and then they'll collide. And they might, the, ele the new particle might be there for a split second. It might be there, if you have hydrogen, it would make helium. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, so once they like collide, doesn't that create somewhat of an explosion? Like how, how is that contained? <laughs> so yes, it creates a whole lot of energy that tends to be, um, like they put it in a certain place inside the particle coll collider um, and because there's only two particles it reduces the amount of energy that's being um, produced but they can capture that and utilize that to actually run the machine too. So it's like kind of like a nuclear, oh that's cool. Kind of like a nuclear reactor but nuclear reactors. Uh, they both have different purposes though. Right, are fission and these would be fusion. Okay. Good. Um, so, we formed a lot of extra elements. If we look back at this periodic table, anything from, from 92 has really been prepared in a lab. Okay? And um, you can see a lot of them have parentheses around their masses. And that's because they, um, they're only there for a really split second. We can't really determine what their molar mass is going to be. Um, we have recently found 113, 115, 117, 118, but the last element that was found was in 2010. These things still need names, and I think they're getting them currently. Um, 116 and 114 are the um, newest. Tennessee, I think, is 117 that just received its name about six months ago. Um, that's the one from tw 2010, right? Yeah. I think. Yep. Okay, and so they're just starting to get their names. And we're just starting to try and build element 119. Okay, so 119 um, would actually become, it would go under francium over in the red column over there. So when 119 gets formed. And it's 118, right, is going to be easier to find than 119. And anything bigger than that is just going to be um, it's going to be difficult to make any more, but I'm kind of excited to see where science goes for all that because it'd be fun. Yeah. So if you're trying to like make something over 119, do you have to get two particles of 119? And no, you just have to have two particles that would potentially add up to 119, right? To have 119 protons. So um, 
you could use tin, right? Mm -hmm. 50, and then you need 69, which would be um, thulium, right? And have two particles of that. But it becomes really difficult. It's not, it takes a long time for these things to kind of, to find out the right conditions, right? What's this right mm -hmm. speed for them to overcome that, that um, force that would pull them apart? Um, so it takes a long time. You guys, what's one of our vocabulary words that would describe kind of finding that right sweet Gold spot? Condition. Goldie lost condition, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so from there, um, oh, and how many of you have ever seen the Iron Man 2 movie? Right? Yeah, so it, it is a good movie, but I had some issues with it because yeah. in his living room, Tony Stark thinks that it's a smart idea to build a particle accelerator, basically one of these, to help to help um, make the element that's like seeping into his veins for his suit or something like that. So wait, wait, the one in, in his basement where they like, put all the pipes together, and then you got like that crystal thing. Yep. And put like a laser through it. Yep. I thought it was cool. It was there so cool. There was a lot of things wrong with it. But, like I thought it was cool. It was exceptionally cool, but it wasn't necessarily scientifically sound. Oh. That was my issue with it, right? Because this guy, it's it's fifteen mile a fifteen mile ring, and he was doing this in his basement. Hmm. Okay, um, so I want to talk a little bit about compounds, um, and mostly carbon based compounds because we are carbon based life forms. So carbon is element number six on our periodic table, so one of the, the early ones, okay? And carbon is able to make four bonds where electrons are being shared. So carbon really likes to be a share, like he's a, he's a sharer, okay? Um, and that's what makes the diversity of all of us so profound because it can share with different things, right? And plants, plants are also living things, carbon-based. And so um, it makes a lot of diversity because of the four bonds that it can make. Um, it has a lot of functionality and ability. And there's an entire area of chemistry. So chemistry is a central science, but it's broken up into different areas. There's inorganic chemistry, and inorganic chemistry is a study of anything that's not carbon. So there's 91 other naturally occurring elements that inorganic chemistry studies. There's organic chemistry, which is just the study of carbon and carbon-based compounds. So medicines, any medicines that you take tend to be carbon-based. Um, there's physical chemistry that's looking at how things react and what energy is being released um, and how fast things react. There's analytical chemistry that's talking about um, the amount of, of comp or like the composition of different things. So does it have a lot of carbon? Does it have a lot of hydrogen? Um, and there's biochemistry. And biochemistry is the, the study of all the chemistry that's taking place inside your bodies or inside living things. Okay, so um, organic chemistry is really cool. It's all about the medicines that you guys take and how it interacts in your body and how we produce all that stuff, how um, it's all about the sugars, right? There's tons of different sugars, glucose and fructose and sucrose and fructulose, right? Like, have you guys all heard the, the, those different words? They're all different types of sugars. Proteins are in your bodies are made up of carbon, and so that's really cool and exciting. Um, rubber and plastics are all carbon-based, so if you're interested in how um, to make a better tire, right? You study organic chemistry because that's um, rubber is is carbon based, and petroleum, so gasoline, is also all carbon based. Um, so compounds are really cool, and especially organic compounds. That's the area of chemistry that I like the best. Um, so. That is all that I have. I, I kind of wanted just to introduce some of the idea of compounds. That's when carbon is making those those sharing bonds. Um, but I'm available for questions if you have any.
Can you ask the questions from like our document? From our reading? Or from like our homework last night where we like made a document? Put yeah, 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 of course, yeah. And then if we have time, I can ask questions from the other class, right. from that document too. Okay, I, I have one. Yeah. We didn't, really, we didn't really talk about it, but it was about black holes. Okay. So my question was, if something, um, something goes into a black hole, is there any way for it to like to come back out? Like that was my first question. And then uh, the other one was like, can it? Or yeah, I'm just gonna ask that one. Like how and how would it be like? Is it is it possible to get it out? Right. So while chemistry is the central science, right? I don't actually know a whole lot about astronomy and black holes, and I think there's still there's still there's a lot of information that we don't know about yeah. black holes. So I'm not actually certain of what that answer might be. Um, but I can certainly try and study it and and send Miss um, Irisina an answer to it. Okay. And I like I just have one other that like is kind of about elements. Okay. Um. So after the sun turns into like a red giant, and, like after like absorbs our solar system as like a supernova. Mm -hmm. Uh. Wait. Yeah. That was my question. What other elements are to be found in, uh, like, there's a lot of other elements we f to be found in stars, like, how would we extract them? Because, like, there's so many stars out there, there's, like, there has to be more elements. Right. Like, how would we get them? Um, I don't know, I think we would have to wait for them to break apart yeah. and then fall to Earth, because I don't think it's feasible for us to go and land on a star to collect any of its stuff. But that's yeah. a really great question. Who knows, right? Who knows? Who thought that we'd have a rover up on Mars right now? Yeah. Um, so it's definitely something to keep thinking about because that could be a potential area of research in the future, for sure. TJ? Um, going back to the balloons and helium, mm -hmm. um, I read in the reading that helium is rare. Is that true? It is. So if it's rare, why don't why do we use it for balloons and not for like, scientific purposes? Um, so it's not used a lot for scientific purposes because of the fact that it's less dense than air and so it wants to rise and so it, we use argon and whatnot for like to to work with compounds that have to be in an inert in an inert atmosphere um but helium because it's already less dense than air it's going to rise anyway so we don't use it in that capacity um and if you notice it's getting more expensive to buy helium balloons so helium is not cheap any longer. When I was a kid, which was a long, long time ago, they, it was it was relatively cheap to go get a, a dozen balloons. Now it costs a little bit more. Yeah. Um, how do elements become unstable and how can that be changed? The neutrons. So those neutrons that are in that nucleus kind of help the protons from having too many um, forces that would want to push them apart, right? Because protons are positive, so the neutrons kind of alleviate some of that stress. And so when you have too few neutrons, then you have more um, instability, be instability because they're trying to push apart. If you have too many neutrons, then you kind of take that nucleus and you push all the protons closer together because you it's only a certain so size. So it's basically finding a balance of expanding versus exactly. forming it on itself? Yep. And that's why there's a lot of elements that are found naturally, like helium-3 and helium-4, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't necessarily see helium-5. Yeah. So going along with that, a question from the other class was, what causes elements to be inert? Um, when they fill up their electron shell, they're inert. So on our periodic table, those noble gases over here, they all finish the row of our periodic table because they have a full electron shell. Um, so that's um, eight electrons typically around that outermost energy level that makes them stable. Would it be possible to combine noble gases and get them to react? And how would you do that? Yeah, so they need good conditions. Um, there have been some compounds found with xenon, so xenon difluoride or xenon tetrafluoride, so having two fluorines or four fluorines around it. 
but it needs special conditions. It needs to have be kind of cold and have the right pressure in order for it to exist. So it is possible, just very unlikely. Yeah. Oh, um, don't the um, like the electron rings? Isn't that like two then eight eight or something? How does it go? Two eight eighteen thirty six. So it can have like two atoms then eight atom like I mean electrons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. When you get into the third energy level and the fourth energy level, it gets a little bit more tricky. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, here's another question from the other class, and I want you guys to help explain it to Dr. Golick. How is the periodic table an example of collective learning? First, who can explain to her what our definition is in this class for collective learning and how we talk about that? Joe. Um, collective learning is basically information that's been passed down through, instead of having the information in our DNA, we actually share it with each other, and it's able to be passed down and stored. So who can answer that question? What do you guys think? Max. Um, so we so like um all the examples she's given us us of like atomic theory and like um like everybody's ideas for like the elements and how they were created. We wouldn't know about this now if it wasn't passed on through information from like human to human. Like it wasn't in like it wasn't even just like in like the it wasn't put into like the internet or anything. It was like literally talk to like even if it was put in the internet there would still be like an example of collective learning because like people have told each other about them and like that's how we know so much that we do mm -hmm. and that's um one of the major things about science is that collaboration and the communication of the science that you do so there's a lot of science journals that um, gather information and are published from peer-reviewed sources so they have to kind of replicate the work in different labs to make sure that it, it holds true. And that's where um, a lot of scientific discovery takes place. So that's really cool. That's a really great question. I like collective learning. Do you? Yeah, because mm -hmm. we've got a square rock on the flight. Not for it. Right. Any other questions? Last chance to ask a question, guys. Anything? Well, let's give Dr. Golic a round of applause. Thanks. This was fun. Yeah. Thank you for coming into our class and teaching us.